the scripture. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Exodus 22:18. 1. Draco, Tarn, Griffin, and Ulrich fled into the dark, congested forest, while three figures followed from somewhere in the black void. Their village of Tanznia, a place of strict religious discipline surrounded by forest, had been put to the torch by these things. In the three months prior, Tanznia had been plagued by witches who had used their spells to infect the children with disease. All nine children within their small village had been afflicted with a mysterious illness after visiting the nearby lake, and all nine had died. Draco and his wife Sarah had no children to lose, but Griffin's own child was amongst the deceased, and while Draco and Griffin had never been close before this, he now considered him a brother in arms. Afterward, the townspeople, led by Tanznia's first knight, had investigated the presence of witches within Tanznia and the surrounding villages and cities. They discovered one within their own village, and after suffering her denial and putting her to the test, punished her with death by stoning as the Holy Scripture decreed, Draco being amongst the executioners. Then two nights ago the attack came. The creatures, adorned in their black robes, swiftly moved about the village killing indiscriminately. The only good thing Draco could take from the massacre was that God had spared the children from this horrible onslaught. Sarah had been killed in the attack, pierced in the arm by a dart that had killed her instantly. It had taken Draco some time to realize what had happened, to realize that his small, doe-eyed Sarah was gone. She was the frosting to his cake, and cake was nothing without frosting. The crisp image of the giant cloaked figure outside their cottage, its arm outstretched in the direction of his wife was, and always would be, burned into his mind. The creature was notably hunched over despite its massive size. Hiding beneath its dark robe was a giant humpback, not unlike that of an ogre's. Everyone had been killed either by darts or by burning. Only Draco, his best friend Ulrich and Griffin had managed to make it out alive. Being unmarried and with no children, Ulrich had been able to make a clean break after meeting up with Draco. The three had swiftly made their way to the house of Tarn, Draco's first cousin and an alchemist, twelve miles north. Tarn was a hermit, and years prior claimed to have killed a creature matching the description of the ones who had ravaged Tanznia. He had killed it with a special compound consisting of human urine, sulfuric acid, and laudanum. He hadn't been able to study the creature, however, because its body had disappeared within seconds of being killed. Tarn had manufactured three hand cannons that were capable of firing this compound, though the user generally had to be within close range of their intended target to effectively spray them. The group hadn't been at Tarn's abode for very long before they sensed their pursuer's presence through the abrupt quiet of the night. Animals always went silent around these creatures. It had been like that at Tanznia and that eerie silence had followed them to Tarn's home. The four had left in haste. Draco, tall, rugged, well-built, and commanding, led the four men through the dark forest because he had the most experience in these parts and, while fighting in the Crusades, had primarily been used as a tracker. Ulrich stomped close behind him, his keen eyes always scanning, while Griffin sent foul looks in Tarn's direction. Tarn mostly ignored them but Draco knew Tarn wouldn't tolerate it much longer. As a bastard, many within Tanznia scorned Tarn, for God would not tolerate the product of an unwed union, as stated in Deuteronomy 23.2. As an alchemist, many had strongly suspected him of dabbling in sorcery and believed he was a warlock. He had also been suspected of committing other unspeakable crimes. Draco never asked Tarn whether the rumors of his crimes were true or not. All he knew was that Tarn was his family, so it was Draco's job to protect him. The scripture was very clear on what should be done if the rumors were true, however. But after what had happened to Draco's sister, he'd rather be ignorant than witness something like that again. Ignorance was bliss. Draco, Tarn, Griffin, and Ulrich moved through a particularly thick section of brush, before coming upon a clearing that, while shrouded by tree branches and greenery overhead, was void of any vegetation on surface level, with the exception of many dried-up leaves. At the edge of the clearing was a dilapidated wooden fence with various holes littered throughout. Draco noted by Griffin and Tarn's slowing pace that the group could use a break. 
There were no indications that the creatures were anywhere near them. This'll be a good spot to rest and hide, Draco said. Griffin and Tarn agreed while Ulrich said nothing. Ulrich, large, stout, and stoic, was the biggest man in the group yet spoke the least. As a blacksmith, he spent much time on his irons in his shop, lost within his thoughts. He had developed a taciturn build and a discipline to match. Like Draco, he could have marched on all night without rest. I'll take first watch, Griffin said before lying prone a few feet behind the fence. Trust the historian over the crusader to keep watch? Tarn mocked Griffin. I hear you can barely read through your texts without falling asleep. Griffin and Tarn were more or less the same size, both possessing average builds more or less. Griffin was short with bronzed skin and ruffled black hair, while Tarn was pale, slightly thinner, with blonde straight hair that reached his shoulders though he had some height on the historian. Both had a stubborn rebelliousness about them, however. Griffin stood up, better than an outcast who'll stab us in our sleep. Well, maybe just you, Tarn said firmly. Enough, Draco interrupted. Griffin is on watch for the next two hours, then I'll relieve him. Let it go. Tarn and Griffin dispersed with their bickering, then Draco found a spot to lie down. As one of the most dominant people in Tanzania, few challenged Draco and he couldn't help but prefer it that way. The others lied down a distance away from Griffin, but within minutes of settling in, Draco saw three birds take to the sky in the distance. Griffin suddenly yelped, rolled over, and went still. A dart was buried in his neck. It dissolved into nothing a moment later. Through a large hole in the fence, three figures shrouded in dark robes shuffled across the adjacent ravine on the far side. When Draco looked closely, he noted the figures had no legs and floated not unlike witches. The wraiths, Ulrich whispered aghast. One was short and lithe, moving with a feminine grace, while another was lean, traveled in the manner of a dog and moved in a sprint. And the third, Draco recognized the third creature. It was the ogre shrouded in robes. We need to leave, Draco said. Two, because Tarn only had three hand cannons, Ulrich had offered to go without, using only the battle axe Draco had made for him on the last midwinter. With Griffin dead, however, each member of their small group now possessed a weapon that could kill these creatures, according to Tarn. It was a shame that they'd already lost Griffin. He was a good man who had been fortunate enough to survive the slaughter of Tanzania only to be killed days later. And after all the historian had suffered, he didn't deserve the death he was given. None of them did. And no more of them would die by these demons if Draco could help it. After returning from the Crusades, Draco had taken up the trade of an armorer. No knight had ever been disappointed with the armor he provided them. It was unfortunate that he hadn't been able to get to his shop before the wraiths had set it aflame on the night of the attack. Perhaps the armor could have protected them from these mysterious darts. The three men moved through the black forest as silent as dormice. The area surrounding them was uncomfortably quiet. They couldn't be sure how close the wraiths were, only that they were out there and they were close enough that not a single animal in their vicinity was making noise. The ruffling of a bush somewhere in the dark prompted an infectious stillness within the group. After some time, the three men pushed forward at Draco's urging. Draco was clutching his hand cannon so tightly, he thought he might snap it in half by accident. Draco truly hoped the compound in these cannons really worked. Tarn had always been a more learned member of Tanzania, even as a child so Draco didn't doubt his cousin's ability, but they were dealing with creatures of hell, and this was likely something only the Lord could handle. Tarn had always been an outlier and rebel against the community's teachings. While Draco, Sarah, and Griffin had always been quite devout, Tarn didn't study the scripture. He mocked it, actually, which was a point of contention between the cousins. Ulric was a believer, but he was nowhere near as committed as Draco and many from Tanznia. Tarn had always been a man of science, finding ways to contort the natural way of things. Six years ago, Tarn had been chased from Tanznia after being accused of killing and experimenting on a drifter for his alchemy. Draco had heard different stories regarding this, though Tarn had denied them vehemently. Against Sarah's advice, Draco and a reluctant Sarah helped Tarn escape from the townspeople and set up a home twelve miles north of Tanznia, where Tarn had lived in exile, in an area that most believed was uninhabitable. 
and would therefore be less likely to visit. Draco had told no one else of his and Sarah's aiding in Tarn's escape, not even Ulrich. When he had brought Ulrich and Griffin to Tarn's home the previous day, both men had been more than surprised to hear of Draco's deed and to see Tarn again. In his heart, Draco felt that helping his kin had been the right thing to do. However, he knew what he had done was a sin because, if Tarn really was a murderer, he needed to be punished as the scripture decreed. Because he didn't know if Tarn truly was a murderer, he could not know whether his deed had been just or not. But by not investigating and confirming Tarn's innocence or guilt, Draco had sinned to some degree. As stated in Matthew 10.37, he had placed his family before God and his teachings, and that was a grievous sin. After what had happened to his younger sister Mary, he'd rather remain ignorant than have to make a decision regarding Tarn's innocence or guilt. Ten years ago, Mary had committed adultery against her new husband. Mary had always been a rebellious girl and a fickle one at that. She had fancied another man, and the two had been discovered within weeks of their affair. Mary and her lover had been swiftly stoned to death for disobeying the holy words as written in Leviticus 20.10. Draco knew what she had done had been wrong and that she had needed to be punished, but he remembered thinking he couldn't let her be killed. The night before her execution, Draco had taken his longsword and had planned to free her and escort her into exile, but Sarah had convinced him not to. Sarah had condemned Mary as a harlot who would meet her just end and would ultimately be judged before God. She reasoned that even if he saved her, there would be nothing he could do to save her immortal soul. So Draco had done nothing. How long before we're out of this forest? Ulrich whispered to Draco from directly behind him. Probably another ten miles, Draco replied in a hushed voice. Although it's hard to keep a true path in such darkness. Ulrich nodded, rubbing his short brown hair. Good thing the Crusades prepared you for a night like this. Draco had spent three years in the Holy Land, spreading the word of Christianity. His father had fought and died for their lord during the Crusades. When he came of age, Draco had joined the war in part to honor his father, but more importantly, to condemn the false religions and extend the reach of his lord to the rest of the world. During the Crusades, his father had been nicknamed God's Blade because he had managed to clear an entire town in the Holy Land with only eleven of his subordinates. Draco, meanwhile, had been utilized as a tracker but had never actually seen real battle with the exception of a few tussles. Because of this, he often felt that he had not truly served God or honored his father during the war. Yeah, Draco responded dourly. Tarn abruptly pulled Draco and Ulrich to the ground. Something fast was moving along the edge of a path below them. The trio were on a slope above the newcomer and could see that it was alone. As it moved in closer, Draco could make out the robe around its form and could see that it moved like a dog. It was the sprinter wraith. Draco didn't think then he acted. He carefully moved down the slope under cover of vegetation as his companions looked on in horror and confusion without moving. Draco stopped once he had made it halfway down the slope and hid within a large bush. The ruffling of leaves as he entered the bush caused the sprinter wraith to stop in its tracks. It was about ten yards away from Draco now. He looked back toward Ulrich and Tarn but saw that they were no longer on the slope above. Where could they have gone? He turned his attention back to the sprinter who was now slowly making its way towards Draco, though at an angle. Draco swallowed and slowly aimed his hand cannon at the creature. He needed it to be close. As it moved closer to him, Draco could see that it still possessed no legs despite its robes reacting to limbs that weren't there. It floated towards him on phantom limbs seemingly not aware of him, but suspicious. Draco felt his fear turn to excitement as the sprinter came into range. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, the verse ran through his mind. By my hand this witch, warlock, or demon will be banished from God's good earth. It felt good to do the Lord's work. As Draco settled his finger on the trigger, the sprinter shifted its gaze in his direction. From its hood, Draco didn't see a face, but something different. A bright white light shone through for only a second. It disappeared as quickly as it had come. The light was blinding, leading Draco to assume it was some kind of weapon the monster had conjured up. He fired his hand cannon, and the sprinter was hurled to the ground. A high-pitched whistle emanated from the beast before it disappeared completely in less than two seconds. Draco emerged from the bush and inspected the area, but could find no trace of it. 
two figures barreled onto the scene. Draco raised his cannon in their direction, but was relieved to see that they were Ulrich and Tarn. He turned to Tarn. It disappeared after I shot it, just as you said. 3. One of the last arguments Draco had had with Sarah was just after church three weeks ago. It was Sunday morning, and she had whispered her discontent on someone bringing their dog to the chapel. The man sitting next to them had irritably hissed the word miss in her direction, before stopping abruptly after noticing a grim and threatening stare from Draco. Draco had been as equally mad at Sarah, however. She had willfully sinned while inside church, and she knew it. When they got home, he roughly sat her down to her surprise and made her read the verse from the scripture that she had disobeyed, 1 Corinthians 14, 34-35. Frustrated but regretful, she read the verse. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. He remembered feeling bad for being so stern with her, but it was for her own good. He hoped the lesson had helped her gain access to God's house and bring her closer to their Lord. His insides churned at knowing that he would never feel her soft petite hands running through his thick black hair again. Since she had been taken from him, he desperately hoped that his Lord was looking after his dear wife now. Are you thinking about... Sarah? Ulrich asked Draco, concerned. Draco remained silent for a moment. Yes, how did you know? I can just tell. She's with God in heaven now, Draco responded dourly. She's not in heaven, Tarn said irritably from behind the two. There's no logical basis for an afterlife. She just doesn't exist anymore. Draco clenched his fists. Watch your tongue, Tarn, or I won't have control over my next actions. Tarn's irritability only seemed to heighten further. Draco... I appreciate what you did for me after the townspeople ran me out of Tanznia. I truly do. But don't pretend that Sarah didn't try to talk you out of it. She treated me like shit for being a bastard and having interests outside of religion. Tanznia was filled with fanatics who regularly committed worse crimes than I ever could in the name of God. Even if heaven did exist, no one here is going there. God's house does exist, Tarn. Draco attempted to calm himself. We've been doing God's work. Killing witches and these... Creatures will bring us into his house. Maybe even you. Tarn laughed with a quiet building rage. Killing witches? You aren't killing witches. You're killing innocent, illiterate women you think are witches. Don't think I don't hear the happenings of Tanznia despite my exile. That last woman wasn't a witch. She was. Draco raised his voice. She let loose a disease into Tanznia that killed the children. We put her to the test and she failed. Draco remembered the late morning trial of the witch, held in the town square of Tanznia for all to see. In order to prove her status, she had to read from the scripture flawlessly. Even one mistake meant that she couldn't stand to hear the words of God and was therefore a witch. If she recited the scripture without error, then she was innocent. She claimed many times that she had never learned to read, but these were simply lies of the wicked. When she failed to recite the first line of scripture, Draco and three other chosen men began hurling the stones. She fell after only two stones struck her head. Seeing that she was still breathing, Draco had found the largest stone around then crushed her head in. It was God's will and he was his spear, just like his father was the Lord's blade. The children didn't die from a witch's spell, Tarn said. They died from playing in a diseased lake. I'm guessing no adults got sick because none of them went in the water, right? Draco had never escorted the children to the lake, but Ulrich had been given this task at times. Draco looked to Ulrich. Only the children went in the water, Ulrich confirmed. See, I'll be straight with you both, Tarn raised his voice. I did kill a drifter for my experiments, but it doesn't matter to me because I'm not bound to your imaginary lord. Don't you find it strange that the scripture says you shall not murder, yet elsewhere permits killing someone for committing adultery, having homosexual sex, or working on a Sunday? Keep quiet, Tarn. The wraiths, Ulrich started, completely disinterested in their argument. It's contradictory, Tarn ignored him. Draco was fuming, though, didn't know how to respond. Tarn continued, We're not here to kill these wraiths or do God's work. The wraiths are here to kill us for all the bad things we've done. Draco suddenly noticed the movement of leaves in the wind. 
He couldn't see the leaves very well, but he could hear them. They were all he could hear. He held up his hand abruptly, then squatted down. The trio were once again near the top of a slope, though there was less vegetation to hide behind. Only three trees, two thick and one rather thin. A dark mass whirred by near the bottom of the slope. Something small whizzed by Ulrich prompting the three men to rush for cover. Draco found himself behind the thin tree while Tarn and Ulrich managed to conceal themselves behind the thicker ones. The dark mass surged up the hill, its robes flailing in response to its quickened pace. Its hood concealed its form, but couldn't hide the hump on its back. Ogre, Draco hissed to himself. The ogre wraith raised its arm as it took cover behind a large tree ten yards down the slope from Tarn who was closest to it. The ogre hurled a dart at Tarn and missed before turning its attention in Draco's direction. A dart flew past his head before another came almost instantly. Draco knew he couldn't hold this position for long without being hit. There was no cover for him behind this tree. So Draco surged forward. He rushed the creature and when he was close enough, fired the liquid compound at the wraith. He missed, and the ogre spun around the other side of the tree and hurled a dart straight into Draco's chest. He fell backward. Draco saw a white ball of light leave his body. Soon, everything that he was, his essence, moved into the sphere. His soul. His soul began to ascend, and things became clearer then. White balls of light rested at the center of Tarn and Ulrich's torsos as well. Draco still couldn't see through the ogre's robe, though he did note a brightness seeping through his hood, similar to what the sprinter had displayed earlier. He felt utter peace as his soul rose higher into the sky. The clouds grew nearer, and he wondered if heaven's domain really did exist within the clouds on another plane of existence. A severely bright orange aura rendered Draco immobile. When his vision became clear, a breathtaking figure appeared before him, transfixed in the sky. The figure was of slim build with two wings on its back. It appeared to be a man with pale human legs, though his arms looked as though they belonged to an ungulate, hooves and all. He possessed a single head with four faces, one that matched a lion positioned to the left side, another of an eagle on the right, and an ox directly facing Draco. Its head turned around until the fourth face, that of a human, faced him. This was a cherub, a member of the first sphere of angels and a gatekeeper of the Garden of Eden. Draco opened himself up to the cherub who held out one of his hooved arms. A silent scream emanated from his mouths, his demeanor turning wicked. Draco felt himself sink from within. Something dark spread throughout his form. He found himself no longer rising in the sky. To Draco's dismay, he was descending. 4. Ulrich looked upon Draco's corpse in disbelief. His closest friend was now dead when only moments ago he had been moving and talking. He couldn't help but focus on the dart protruding from Draco's chest. What was this otherworldly contraption that took lives in an instant? He would never know, however, as the dart vanished into nothing a moment later. The heightened state of the predicament caused Ulrich's adrenaline to flood through his body. The ogre wraith suddenly sprinted toward the nearby tree Tarn was hiding behind. Tarn was anxiously fiddling with something on his hand cannon. With the creature out in the open, and Tarn's very existence being threatened, Ulrich brought his hand cannon forward and aimed at their foe. Ulrich barely had time to register what happened next. Tarn stepped out from behind the tree to contend with the incoming wraith and was swiftly met with a dart to the neck. An abrupt gurgle escaped from Tarn's lips as he sank to the ground. Before the ogre wraith could turn his sights to Ulrich, the compound from Ulrich's hand cannon had already covered the wraith. An ear-tingling whistle left the creature as a bright white light escaped from the robes of the wraith. When the blinding light had dissipated, any trace of the wraith was gone. Ulrich stood alone on the slope with only silence and the corpses of his companions to accompany him. The quiet of the dark forest night only made him feel more alone. He shuddered in place, having to cup his hand over his mouth to keep himself from bursting into tears. He had never felt this alone in his entire life. Everyone he had ever been close to was dead, except for maybe one person. He quickly moved away from the scene, taking a brief glance at the bodies of Draco and Tarn, noting he would never see them again. Not in this life. There was still one more wraith out there and Ulrich had no interest in killing it. He simply intended to run from it. 
He moved carefully through the forest, taking every effort not to step on or brush past anything that would make noise. As he moved further away from the battleground, Ulrich could hear the birds in the trees and the skittering of rodents on the dirt. His heartbeat leveled out then. His mind turned to his possible future. With Tanznia put to the torch and everyone from there dead, he had nothing to go back to. Maybe this was finally his opportunity to pursue the life he wanted. Maybe it was time he seek out Peter. Or maybe the village of Hockney would be no different than Tanznia. Peter had said it was less harsh, but not by much. Ulrich ground his teeth, noting the life he had missed out on. People like Draco and Griffin were so fanatically devoted to the scripture that people like Ulrich would never be able to live the lives they wanted. Ulrich noted a sudden feeling of relief as the notion of Draco's death finally settled in. What a horrible thought, he mulled over. Draco had been his best friend since he could remember, but while Draco was loyal, dependable, disciplined, and selfless in his own way, he was also judgmental, closed-minded, and a murderer. He was as good of a man as he was bad. Above everything else, he was the type of person who was keeping the world from moving forward, from learning. When Ulrich had first realized he was homosexual, he was only 16 years old. He had almost confided in Draco, but had decided against it after a sermon one Sunday morning had declared homosexuality an abomination. Ulrich had seen the fervor in Draco's young eyes as he raised his arms in the air, emphatically agreeing with the pastor. Draco was particularly prone to biblical fanaticism. He took after his father who followed the scripture literally and without divergence. Ulrich noted more extreme behavior from Draco after his return from the Crusades. In comparison to his father's actions during the Crusades, Draco had confided in Ulrich that he felt he had mostly been a bystander in the war. Ulrich believed Draco overcompensated in his hunt for witches because he hadn't done enough of God's work during the Crusades. Ulrich had never been good about memorizing the scripture, not like Draco had, but he would always remember one verse perfectly until the day he died. Leviticus 2013. If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. It didn't seem right that he couldn't be with the person he loved because the Bible decreed it wrong. Though he didn't want to stray from the scripture's words because that was a clear path to hell, this reason alone motivated many of his actions and his obedience to the Lord. Ulrich had never done anything as extreme as bashing a woman's head in like Draco, though that wasn't to say he had never been involved in any questionable acts in the name of the Lord. He had just killed the ogre Wraith, though it was completely justified. The wraith had killed his friends, and besides, it was either he killed the wraith, or it killed him. On the night the witch was killed by Draco, however, Ulrich had been one of the men to break into her home and drag her to the town square. Ulrich wasn't even completely convinced of her guilt at the time. He simply felt obligated to go along with the others because they were following the scripture, and going against them would be going against the scripture. And doing that never ended well in Tanznia. And as a homosexual, the afterlife may not end well for him either. He feared the afterlife constantly. God would not accept him because of how he truly felt inside, so maybe if he followed the Bible as closely as possible, the Lord would spare him the suffering of hell and grant him passage into heaven. He couldn't help but feel a burning rage building inside him as he wandered further in the darkness. He hadn't seen Peter in five years. Ulrich had ended it after two men in Hockney had been hung after being caught together in the act. It was then when Ulrich realized he would never be able to live the life he wanted in peace. If he had stayed with Peter, it would have been on borrowed time. The two married in secret, of course. They even waited to consummate their relationship until after they were married as the Bible decreed. But despite following the scripture almost to the word, none of it mattered. If he and Peter went public with their lifestyle, he could physically beat almost anyone into submission that objected or tried to kill them for disobeying the Bible, but it didn't matter. One or two people could do nothing if the culture and the afterlife itself were against them. So he had chosen to end his relationship with Peter. And despite that, he would likely never be granted into God's congregation anyway. Ulrich clenched his fist as the rage continued to build and almost punched the trunk of a tree but stopped himself. His rage completely evaporated when he realized how silent the forest was. Something dark moved from behind a tree toward him. He raised his hand cannon and fired, but something small and fast knocked it out of his hands completely. 
He saw the dart buried into his weapon. The figure was close now, too close for a dart. The blade appeared from under the robe. Ulrich screamed. He lay on the ground, clutching a massive laceration across his torso, blood pouring from the wound. Wide-eyed, he trembled at the creature who stood at his feet. The short, lithe wraith sheathed the blade somewhere within its robe as it stared down at him. What's happening? was all he could say. The wraith became rigid, then it did something he did not expect. It pulled back the hood of its robe, revealing a blinding white light before it removed its robe altogether. Ulrich had imagined something much worse beneath the robes of the wraith, like a beast. But it was no beast at all. The only word that came to mind when looking at its true form was beauty. It had a female humanoid form made completely of light. She had long flowing hair made from an even lighter hue of white. Two wings sprouted from her back like those of white doves. She was no wraith. She was an angel. Why are you killing us? Ulrich choked. You know. She said in a harmonic voice. I never had bad intentions, he started. I obeyed the scripture because I thought it was God's commands. You didn't want to burn. Your village killed innocents in the name of insanity. Your village was massacred for its atrocities against humankind. Yes, I'm sorry, he said before pausing. Do not be sorry. You will be judged accordingly. I know. Ulrich felt himself fading. Where are the souls of Draco, Griffin, and Tarn? Has Peter been judged? I do not know Peter. The others have only recently come into my knowing. They are where they should be. I'm sorry. Where will I go? The next life is not as you think. The white ball of light left his body and the concept of time became irrelevant all in one moment. The angel and his body were now below him as his new form rose. The sky turned from black to purple. A winged creature with hooved arms, human legs, and four different faces soared toward him in the distance. Ulrich felt an intense feeling. Panic. Take over. The cherub stopped within feet of him, its wings fluttering eloquently in place as its eyes bored into him. Ulrich felt darkness within himself and didn't know what to do. The cherub held a hooved arm out then. It smiled. Ulrich suddenly felt light take the place of darkness. He opened himself up to the figure. To Ulrich's delight, he found himself ascending 